the, and this, uh, the DVD and uh, documentary, I feel like it does a great job encompassing all what Twisted Sister is all about. Um, but it starts at the very beginning, and it, it focuses on uh, two very special venues, uh, Speaks and Emmett's Inn. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what it was about those, those two venues um, that were so special that you wanted to include those two specific ones? Well, first of all, you have to understand that the movie, the DVD was had a director, and it's his. You know, whenever you see a DVD or a movie, it's a director's version mm. of you know what they believe, what information they got, and that's what they um, kind of go with in a script. Um, not that he's wrong at all; he's very good at doing his job. Um, Speaks was a mega, mega important room for us. All right, it was Twisted Sisters' home on Long Island, theoretically. I mean, it really was. Speaks and Hammerheads. Um, you know, Emmett's, which was an important room, I'm not playing it down at all, certainly was nowhere near in size or popularity that Speaks was. Speaks was a room that held 2,000, 2,200 people. You know, Emmett's was a lot smaller, probably a third of the size. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it was a, a whole different feel. I mean, Speaks actually had the feel of a, a small concert hall and Emmett's had the feel of a club. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So th those are mega differences, and I'm not trying to play Emmett's down at all. I'm just, uh, you know, I don't know why he honed in on Emmett's so much. Right. But right. I guess because Emmett's also Bob Garvey was one of the few club owners left alive that he could talk to. <laughs> that makes sense. Were there any venues, yeah. were there any venues that you wished he, they would have included that uh, maybe you, for you personally were important? Well, I, you know, I don't like it. You know, this personal in this band, I think that the band view is important. You know, Hammerheads on Long Island was another home of ours. You know, both the original one and, and we, we played the last night in the original Hammerheads in Levittown, and the fans literally tore it apart. I mean, they took wow. the bathrooms, they took the stalls, they took, they took the air conditioning out of the ceiling. I mean, there was water, there was pipes that were burst open, and we had to stop the show, you know, about three-quarters of the way through because water was pouring out of the ceiling. Oh so it was, it was a riotous situation in Hammerheads in Levittown the last night the band played there. Wow. It was insane. That's but amazing. they were closing the room and gutting it and turning it into a, a restaurant or something. But, nice. And then Hammerheads, the name was used in another big club in West Islip, which, again, was, was roughly the size of Speaks. It was, it was kind of a concert hall-feeling club that big okay okay one, yeah one, one thing that uh one thing that the uh the movie talked about that i wanted to ask you about personally was you, you talked a little bit about um the dictators and some of the success you had with the dictators touring the world and opening for some bigger bands how did that experience prepare you for what came later with twisted sister um it, it brought the experience of actually touring, not being a club band anymore. Um, I was able to teach these, teach the guys in the band and give them my experiences about touring because up until the time that Twisted actually got signed and we started doing Under the Blade and actually doing big shows and touring, we never really went far from home. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we spent our lives within a hundred mile radius of New York City. Right. So getting on a tour bus and, and also flying someplace was a whole new experience for the guys in the band. I brought that experience to the band and told them about it and gave them the warnings and the pluses and minuses of being away from home for you know weeks, if not months, on end. Oh, wow. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's insane. Um, so, I mean, were there, going into all of it, um, I mean, were there some nerves with the rest of the guys in the band when success happened and everything or were you able to really kind of help kind of maybe calm some of those nerves or can you really I, I, I can't I, I I can't speak for the other guys I don't think I don't I don't believe AJ was nervous I don't believe D you know D might have been nervous for another reason but I never knew him to be nervous I never knew JJ to be nervous either I pretty much helped the guys with all the information that I gave okay. them about touring you know it's so funny when when we finally got on a tour bus, <laughs> we finally got a tour bus, and it was the first time the band had gone west of the Mississippi River. You know, it was so funny. It was the middle of the day. We crossed the Mississippi. Everybody's looking out the windows on the tour bus. And uh, now we're on the west side of the Mississippi. I say, you guys feel any different? They go, no. <laughs> well, there you go. 
<laughs> there you go. We're in western Mississippi where you guys have never been before, and you still feel the same. Nice. So, yeah, I mean, you didn't have to show a passport to cross the Mississippi, so don't That's worry true. about it. That is true. Yes. <laughs> yes, although um, it feels like it sometimes, but you don't have to. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the concert itself because it's a really special concert. It was the uh, – it was the first performance um, since AJ's passing, and you had Mark, um, you had Portnoy sitting in. Can you take take me a little bit into the mindset of getting ready to take the stage for that specific show? Or was it any different than other shows for you? No, it was it was it was quite different. Um, Mike Portnoy um, didn't replace AJ. He had to come in and play because. Yeah. We had no choice with AJ. What a what a tremendous and horrible loss for us. Because um, uh, let me backpedal a little bit about some history with AJ. Um, when AJ finally joined the band, it really clicked. It was like gears in a fine watch meshing. It really was. He was just the other part of the rhythm section. Rhythm section that made it work. Not only that is you can replace the drummer. You can replace the musician but you can't replace the person. Right. AJ was a family member. He was a brother. He was, you could rely on him. He was as, as much as you have to pay your taxes, you can rely on AJ. Not only as a person, but as a musician and a drummer in a band. AJ was quite possibly one of the funniest guys in the band. <laughs> so when you take all of that away, you're worried about replacing it. Well, you can't, you can't, can't replace the it. person, without a doubt. Okay, so we had to find, with AJ's help, believe it or not, because as he said to us, if anything ever happens to me, Mike Portnoy is a good friend and he's a good replacement. So Mike Portnoy was the first one we called. And, uh, you know, I spoke to him, so did JJ a bunch of times on the phone. We sent him all the information, all the live shows and all the recordings and he, our first rehearsal, he came in at 98%. Right. We had to fine-tune him so little bit. He really emulated AJ's playing. He really did. He got up there and did it. And hence, the DVD you're watching, or you watched, um, Mike Portnoy did a great job. Mm -hmm. He did a stupendous job. And he's a great guy. I mean, he's, a, he's a lot of fun. He's a character in his own right. And a lot of fun. So, although the transition was tough because... Somebody passed away, and you got to find a replacement. Mike Portnoy made it as smooth, smooth and as easy as possible. I don't think it could have been any better with someone else. Yeah, it looks like the show went off very beautifully. I mean, and and you guys yeah. talked in the D, in the in the movie about it. it. Only took maybe three or four rehearsals, I think, and it was just good. Yeah, to we go. did we did four. I think we did three in rehearsal studio rehearsals. And then we did a couple in Vegas before the show. I think we did two the day before the show. And then we did one, obviously, during the, the, the day of the show, a sound check, and, and rehearsed anything that we thought could that needed help. But Mike Portnoy did his homework, mm -hmm. he did his studying, and he came in and, and kicked ass. He really did. That's for sure. Um, I mean, um, when, when you're – doing a show, just doing a show, and then you're doing a show recording it for a, a DVD release. Is there any difference between the two experiences, or are they pretty, this pretty similar for you? Do you have to do anything differently to prepare or on stage or anything? Well, I, I don't know if you know I produce the band. Okay. I, I actually do didn't, all the, all I the did studio. know that. Actually. Yes. If you look at the albums, my name is producer on, on everything since we got back together, and some other things before that. Um, so me, I, I have to go there and I have to work in the remote truck and help set up everything and let them know where all the cues are. Of course, oh, my, wow. my engineer, George Marshall assists, but I spent the whole day there before the show assisting with sounds and cues Jeez. and especially light cues also and lighting also, because I know where all the light cues are. So I have to help the, the, um, the whole stage, the whole stage lighting plot, and, and things like that. So I spend the whole day there, oh, um, wow. where the other guys show up for you know the the regular uh, stuff and 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 maybe interviews and and some uh, some pre show stuff. But I'm there all day, oh, all wow. day. Yeah, I'm like a crew member at that point. Oh, you know, oh, I'm man. I'm working. 
working with sound and lights, yeah, because it's being recorded. As far as on stage, we go out there and we do our show. Okay. Uh, we, we have to give our visual show to the audience. Not only that, sonically also, um, right. you know, we had that great, right? but we do what we do because it's also being videotaped. So we get out there and, uh, and, and do our show. But there's a lot of production that I'm involved with uh, to make these things happen. I had a little bit of extra stress to your day getting ready to film that. Uh, make sure everything. I've been doing this stuff. Me. I've been doing. I've been doing this stuff for forty years. Yeah. There's no stress. That's awesome. I don't stress out of any of these things. I don't get stage fright. I don't get nervous. I've been doing this for a long time. Another I know day exactly what to do to make it happen. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't seem to be one of those people that just doesn't get nervous about anything. I feel like in your position, if you get nervous, it could affect the whole show. If you get nervous even a little bit. Well, it could, but I never did. Even even in my early days, before the Dictators, when I was in a club band, a local club band, um, I never got nervous. I, I, I enjoyed, I love what I do. I love what I do. It's in my blood, so it doesn't make me nervous. I, I never came from that angle. Cool. I do. I do know, I do understand that other people in various bands and stuff get nervous and they got to have a, you know, a shot of whiskey or a sip of wine or a beer or something. That's not me. I've never been like that. There, there's two moments in the show that really struck me. One of them is during the price when when you guys take all of the house lights down, all of the stage lights down. It's just lighters and phones. Um, the other one is, um, which I've never, this is the first experience I've had seeing a Twisted Sister show, unfortunately, but with I Wanna Rock, everyone's screaming, rock, rock. Those two moments really hit me. Um, being on stage for those moments during a show, can you put that into words, what it's like for you with that adrenaline running through your veins when those moments hit? Well, let's, let's um, yeah, we can reflect upon that very easily. Um, when, let's go with the easy one. I want to rock, okay? That's mm -hmm. every night yeah. at every show. And just think about us like we did at Grass Pop for 110,000 people. Can you imagine what that's like? I can't. I, okay, I, that's I louder can't. than the music. You know, I don't, want, I don't want to go from the Vegas show because that's really what the interview is about. But I'm just saying, so the rock part, I mean, that's every night. But yeah. can you imagine 110,000 people screaming rock? It's louder than the music. I, I would love to experience so that. So the adrenaline, the rush you get from that is incredible. Even in Vegas when we were there, the right. size of this show, it's still an amazing rush. The other part, the price, yeah. when the lights go down and dedicated it to AJ, right? Mm -hmm. That's basically what he did. Yeah. I mean, we all started to cry. I mean, uh, big tough guy that I am, I got welled up, I got misty-eyed, I got a lump in my throat, and I'm like, damn, this is incredible. You know, but again, it, it's, it's, you know, one of the parts, one of the parts in the night that always gets you. It always does, because he always dedicates it to AJ and, mm -hmm. and the people in the music industry that we've lost, um, you know, mm -hmm. recently. So it always gets you. It's always something. You always think of AJ. The other part of the night, if I can add this to you, that really yeah. got to me. Uh, if you remember when we did the song Burn in Hell and we went into yes. the drum solo? Yes. Okay, it's AJ up on the screen? Yes. You remember that? Yes. That got to me, watching yeah. AJ play that drum solo. That got know? to me a little bit, and, too. I mean... It was, oh, yeah, without a doubt. And, yeah. and it was amazing that we had that footage of a show that was only from the Faroe Islands, uh, I think, two summers before that. And, uh, um, you know, it, it was an amazing drum solo. It was incredibly shot, and the sound was great. Mm -hmm. And Mike Portnoy, an amazing drummer in his own right, just said, Can we have, you mind if we have AJ do the drum solo? And he goes, What are you kidding? This is about him. That's do awesome. it. I'll start it, and you can fade into it. And, you know, that got me. That, that, that I, I felt. You know, I felt my heart palpitate watching AJ up on that screen. Yeah, I mean, that was that moment as well. I mean, that was that one was almost as powerful as the lights coming down, if not more, just because yeah. you're watching, you're watching AJ play. I mean, and it is... Yeah, we, it, it, what, what people couldn't see, I don't think they could because the stage was dark, <clears throat> but... Um, D and I are on stage left together, and JJ and Eddie are on the other side. And, uh, you know, we're standing there, and D put his arm around me and leaned on me. <laughs> you know, watching AJ. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
wow. I, I, I don't even know what to say. That's just, um, wow. That's emotional. Yeah. Um, incredible. Yeah. Um, one thing that I wanted to talk about, obviously it's, it's, it's 40 years of Twisted Sister this year. Um, and oh, yeah. this, this being the final touring year of Twisted Sister, but what have the last 40 years, if you can encompass it, what stands out to you about Twisted Sister's career the last 40 years? I mean, it's been a hell of a ride the last 40 years. Well, we were broken up for about 13 years in the middle yeah. of it all. Yep. You know that. Um, what stands out, um, I have to say, and I'll put it in different terms instead of music and rock and roll. What do I want to say about this? I would say that D is the best quarterback in the business. Hands down, he is the best quarterback. And he has the best lineman in the business. No one can get to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll be egotistical about it, and I'm, I'm really not egotistical. I'm not that type of a person. Um, we take apart every audience and we take apart every band that we play with. Okay. It's the combination of those people and that name and the fact that we're a well-oiled machine that has been doing this for a long time and no circumstances, no anything, even AJ passing can stop us from doing what we love to do and getting the job done. And we get it done, obviously, every single night that we play. Mm-hmm. I I read an interview yesterday, this is somewhat related, where I was reading an interview from Joe with Def Leppard where he'd gotten kind of criticized about saying that his band was better than everybody else, but he backed it up by saying, if you're in a band, you have every right to believe that you are the best band in the world because it's your band. And so I really feel like that is probably the best answer you could have given me it's you know it's your work it's your art but, it's your you know relative you you can't be liked or loved by everybody every music fan exactly you know it's just whatever floats your boat i mean whatever whatever you like i mean there's people who don't like rock music who want to hear jazz or they want to hear country or they want to hear rap or whatever yeah. you know music yeah. is is very subjective it, it it's whatever floats your boat whatever makes your heart beat, whatever kind of music it is. So you know, can you claim to be the best band in the world? Well, you can if you're in the band, but does it really mean you're the best? We go by what all the reviews around the world say and what every promoter and every other band says on the bill with us. You know, at the end of the show, you know, we get, holy crap, man, you guys just turn this audience into fanatics. So there isn't a single night where we don't conquer whatever situation we're in as a band. Well, I mean, and the, you have some of, you guys have written some of the best anthems of all time. And then there's a song yes, like, of then you've got a song like The Price, which I feel is one of the, one of the best ballads of, of our time. Honestly, it's, it's a very, very well-written, well-played song. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's a, it's a song, you know, lyrically and especially lyrically that fits many positions. I'll never forget in the 80s when the Challenger, the space shuttle crashed, you know, and we went on stage that night and D dedicated it to the, you know, the people aboard Challenger, the astronauts who died, um, you know, for this country. And uh, it was very fitting. You know, it works. The lyrics, the feel, what the song is about works for all of this stuff, whether it's AJ's passing or the Challenger or you know, a, a terrorist attack around the world and we're dedicating it to the people who died and got hurt in it. Mm-hmm. It all works. It's what, what the song is about. You know, you, it's the price. Yeah. Um, and one th- another thing I wanted to talk about is um, in the movie even, you guys mentioned that you guys, when you guys split, you split before, you know, everything with like grunge and whatnot hit. Do you feel like the splitting up when you guys did helped you for when you came back um, and helped with maybe some success when you came back? Um, you know, you that's a tough, that's a, that's a tough thing to say. Um, there are so many angles being in the music industry and being involved right in the middle and being ground zero and this stuff. It's a really tough thing to say. You look at bands like Poison and Motley Crue and, and, and um, Ozzy and 
and Judas Priest and, and Motorhead, they never stopped playing. They never stopped making records or CDs, and they never stopped playing, you know. And their careers went on. Sometimes yeah. it was a little slower. Sometimes it was a little bigger. Yeah. Um, but when we came back, we were 100 times bigger than we were in the 80s. You yeah. know, our success now live is tremendous. And so how do you how do you do that? You don't have a crystal ball. Right. You know, does it say you did the right thing, you did the wrong thing? Um, you know, grunge, that whole grunge scene when it came out, it certainly hurt the heavy metal hard rock yeah. bands. There's no doubt about it. But being the size of certain these bands, they persevered and went right through it and are still around today. So, you know, how do you really know? You, you don't. You really don't know. Uh, everybody gives their own synopsis and opinions on it, but I don't know. I really don't. I mean, for for Twisted Sister, it was the it was the right time because the band was melting down internally. It was the right time for us to break up. Not grunge coming out or any of that stuff. We broke yeah. up because the band couldn't stay together any longer. Right. Um, yeah. So it didn't have anything to do with grunge. It just was the timing. Right. Um, and finally, the, the 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 last thing I got for you is, I mean, with this being the last, uh, the final uh, final touring year for you guys, are there any plans? I know you guys are playing a lot of the European festivals, and mainly the European festivals are the main things that have uh, that you guys have right now. And then there's a show, a couple U.S. shows. Um, but do you guys foresee maybe one final U.S. trek? coming up maybe in the fall or winter to say goodbye or do you think that maybe the shows that are scheduled are well right as of right now october 1st in new jersey that big festival yeah. there is our final yeah. show okay. right now might there be one or two after it in other places <laughs> not only in this country other places in the world yeah there's talk of a couple of shows there's no okay. tour there's gotcha. no anything um you know the the band the guys in the band are so busy doing so many other things that we can't just decide okay we're going to go out for four months and tour right we're all ever right. since we got back together we agreed that we're not going to kill ourselves touring and destroy mm -hmm. our lives what we've built over many years so we tour a lot of the reasons that we don't tour and we just pick various shows to play is because everybody's so busy in their personal lives we decided to make it easy on ourselves and not have okay. to worry about a touring schedule and tearing us away from our businesses and families Gotcha. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, in two, yeah. two so we're, we're days, essentially, uh, essentially, we're the we're the biggest part time band in the world. <laughs> That's very true. We're headlining all these shows above bands that that play a hundred, a hundred fifty, two hundred nights a year. And we, what do we play? Twenty, <laughs> twenty <laughs> shows a year. Yeah, that's it. it. So we're the biggest oh, part time part time band in the world. It works. I mean, if it, hey, it, it, it certainly ain't broke, does. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, hey, it works. Yeah, no, it, it, it certainly works. It keeps us in demand. In the business, it keeps us in demand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people, we also we certainly get a hell of a lot more offers to play than what we pay. Oh, I bet. I mean, in touring yeah. nowadays, it's different than it used to be. I mean, it takes a lot more time and investment to, to do a, a three- or four-month tour. I mean, it's, it's, it's different. Sure. So, well, the costs are, are, are astronomical. Yeah. You know, the insurances are astronomical. Behind the scenes, the insurance is astronomical. The, you know, fuel and and pay, you know, you pay for people and hotels and tolls and everything that nobody ever thinks of about, about a band that they have to pay for. You know, it's, it certainly costs a lot more these days. Yeah, definitely. Um, sure. But, man, uh, man, thank you so much for taking time to talk to me today. The DVD, the documentary, the show – very, very, very well done and well put together. It was definitely worth the time watching it and taking time to do. Um, and again, thank you for talking to me. And it's been, I mean, thank you for being such a big part of my life for as long as you have. I no, can't. it's not a, it, it, not not a problem. If there's anything I can, we could ever do for you again, you know, just contact Amanda. Absolutely. Um, and she will uh, she'll line something up. Absolutely. And um, yeah, yeah, it's not a problem. You have anything else? Anything in parting? No, sir. That that is that is all I had. But yeah, thank you for okay. uh, thank you for everything. Not a problem. Thanks for being a great interviewer.